Welcome to another Tuba Da Vinci video. Today we're talking electric cars, but not in the way you're probably thinking. When it comes to EVs, most people think about how efficient and better for the planet they are. We will cover this in future videos, but today we want to talk about if EVs are actually more dynamic and better to drive than their gasoline counterparts. If you look at the design philosophy of something like a Tesla Model 3, you get a glimpse into the future of the automobile. There is no driver gauge cluster. There are barely any controls at all. Tesla is giving you a look into the future where humans won't be the ones doing the driving. Soon that steering wheel will be replaced with a laptop tray or beverage holder. But realistically, that fully self-driving future is still over a decade away for regulatory reasons if nothing else. So until that time, we humans will be the ones doing the driving. And the question of how EVs handle and perform will remain important. So let's break down EVs in the following categories. Aerodynamics, weight distribution and center of gravity, engines versus motors, and transmissions and power delivery. Let's start by looking at aerodynamics, where the main difference is one that we've all gotten so familiar with that we've begun to see it as a feature and not a flaw. That is a car's front grille. Internal combustion cars need big front grills for air intakes to feed their engines and radiators to cool those engines. Internal combustion cars aren't very efficient and over 50% of the burnt fuel is wasted as heat and noise. In contrast, EVs are between 80 and 90% efficient and therefore require less frontal area for cooling. Many of our commenters have called the Tesla Model 3 ugly because of the lack of a big grill in the front. Big front grills on cars are becoming an anachronism and many EVs still feature fake grills just because people are so familiar with them. BMW sports their iconic kidney grills while Lexus has their controversial spindle grill. However you may feel about these styling keys, they're bad for aerodynamics. Now it would take many years of engineering school to fully understand aerodynamics, but let's give it a go. To understand the ideal aerodynamic design, we need look no further than mother nature. The raindrop, pulled by gravity, fighting air resistance, naturally takes the form of the perfect aerodynamic shape. The leading edge is rounded to shed air in every direction with minimal flat spots causing stagnation. The trailing edge tapers to a near point, allowing all the redirected air to stay connected as it travels and ultimately converge at the end. This explains why all commercial airplanes look more or less the same. Okay, so why is a rounded nose so important? Well, let's see what a rectangular box would look like in a wind tunnel in comparison. Because there's a big flat spot in front, there is going to be a stagnation point where the air comes to a grinding halt. This is really bad, like air hitting a sail and pushing it back. But it gets worse because this stagnated air causes a high pressure region that pushes the flow around the rectangle further out instead of right on the surface. This coupled with the flat rear end of the rectangle means the diverted air must travel much further before converging again. To understand why this is bad, let's think about drinking a beverage through a straw. What you're actually doing is sucking out the air inside the straw, causing a vacuum which forces the liquid up the straw in the direction of lower air pressure. If you turn that analogy on its side, the trailing edge of the rectangle results in a near vacuum. This vacuum sucks the rectangle back, just like liquid in our straw. This is why cars like the Toyota Prius or the Porsche 911 have rear ends that taper down in a fastback style. Bringing this back to EVs, a smoother front end will result in a lower drag coefficient. With internal combustion cars, more air collides with radiators and other bits in the engine compartment. Now it's important to note that hydrogen fuel cell cars are still electric, but they do need air intakes to provide oxygen to react with the liquid hydrogen. But this smoother front end is the only real advantage that EVs have. Any car can have smooth body panels and increasingly more crossover SUVs have the swooping coupe-like design but it does appear that EV makers like Tesla obsess about aerodynamics more than other companies. Teslas have flush mount door handles, wind tunnel tested side mirrors, and all their cars are top of the class when it comes to aerodynamic efficiency. To put this in context, the biggest and bulkiest Tesla, the Model X, has a drag coefficient of 0.24, while a similar Audi Q7 has a drag coefficient of 0.33. So the smoother and less interrupted front end of EVs help with this, but to fully understand their obsession with drag coefficients, you have to consider how costly it is to add range. Want 100 more miles of range in a gasoline car? Just add 30 pounds of fuel capacity. Want to add 100 miles of range to an EV? 
Well, that will cost thousands and weigh hundreds of additional pounds in batteries. Tesla obsesses about aerodynamics because it's the best way to squeeze out every last mile out of their battery packs. Okay, so EVs have a slight advantage in the aerodynamics department. But how do they stack up against their internal combustion rivals when it comes to overall vehicle weight, weight distribution, and center of gravity? You might be thinking that EVs have a disadvantage here due to their heavy battery packs, and you're right. But you have to remember the average petrol car has an engine that weighs around 400 pounds, another 150 pounds for the transmission, and another 100 to 200 pounds for the gas and gas tank. In comparison, the Tesla Model 3 Long Range has a battery pack that weighs 1,000 pounds, and electric motors weigh about 75 pounds or 150 if you have dual motors. So internal combustion cars are usually lighter, but what's equally important is how that weight is distributed. The ideal weight distribution is evenly spread left to right, front to back, and as low to the ground as possible. The center of gravity, or center of mass, is a point in 3D space where all the mass to either side of it is equal. To best understand this idea, let's consider a seesaw. If you have equal weight on either side, the pivot point should be right in the middle to balance both loads. However, if weight on one side is twice as heavy, that pivot point would need to move closer to the heavier mass to balance the two. This pivot point in the seesaw analogy corresponds to the center of gravity. Early hybrids that were conversions from gasoline cars like the Honda Civic Hybrid have a poorly placed battery pack, usually under the rear seat or trunk. In contrast, pure EVs purpose-built from the ground up have battery packs that are placed evenly throughout the floor of the vehicle. So even though EVs weigh more, this weight is evenly distributed and very low to the ground. Petrol cars have a decision to make when it comes to engine placement. Most cars have the engine in the front, mounted transversely if it's front-wheel drive, and longitudinally if it's rear-wheel drive. More exotic cars are mid-engine, again in an effort to put more of the big masses closer to the center. Electric cars have an advantage here because the heaviest part of the car, the batteries, are placed on the floor, and electric motors are lighter in comparison. For maximum handling and cornering performance, there are a few key elements. The first is having the center of gravity as low as possible, and the second is weight distribution from front to back. The rollover angle is the angle from a line drawn from the contact wheel to the car center of gravity. This affects two things, the car's rolling from side to side in turns, and also its tendency to pitch forward and back during acceleration and braking. Sir Isaac Newton's first law of motion is that a body at rest tends to remain at rest. This means as you start to turn, the car, acting at its center of gravity, wants to keep going in its original direction. The higher the center of gravity is from the wheel axle, the greater the body roll, and the easier it is to tip over. Let's compare a hypothetical car with wheels connected to just a rectangular chassis. In this extreme, the center of gravity is in line with the wheel axle, which would totally eliminate body roll and make it practically impossible to roll over. In contrast, if you had a big off-roading truck with a lifted suspension, the center of gravity would be much higher and as a result, the rollover angle increases and the vertical component of the resulting roll puts a strong downward force on the contact wheels and a lifting force on the opposite wheels, rather like a seesaw. This is what causes cars to roll when turning and should be minimized as much as possible. For that riding on rails feel, you need a very low center of gravity coupled with a stiff suspension setup. Now let's turn our focus from the front of the car to the sides, where again the center of gravity comes into play, applying the same roll angle principle, but this time, instead of side to side, from forward to aft, we see a similar phenomenon. The roll angle is once again the angle between the line joining the contacting wheel through the center of gravity. When you slam on the accelerator and speed up, the inertia of the car's mass wants to remain at rest and will act in the opposite direction of travel. This will cause the car to pitch up, putting more downward force on the rear wheels and an upward force on the front wheels. During braking, the opposite is true. The car inertia wants to keep it moving and the direction of the force points forward. The vertical component of this force pushes down on the front wheels and lifts up on the rear wheels. This is why cars always have bigger brakes on the front wheels than on the back wheels, and why most performance cars have rear wheel drive. The added downforce on the front wheels allows for a greater friction force on the front tires and allows the brakes to exert greater stopping force than the rear brakes. For rear wheel drive cars, 
The added downward force during acceleration means greater normal force, greater friction, and greater traction to put the power down to the road than front wheel drive cars. Now that being said, let's look at some CGZ, or center of gravity in the vertical axis of different cars. The BMW 3 Series is one of the most popular sports sedans around the world, and has a center of gravity of 20 inches, but the electric BMW i3 beats it at 18.5. The Toyota 86, or Subaru BRZ, is praised for its low CG of 18.1 inches. Hypercars are low CG champs. The Porsche 911 GT3 measures in at 17.9 inches, and the Lexus LFA at 17.7. But one car that beats them all is the all-electric Tesla Model S, measuring in at just 17.5 inches. The Tesla Model 3 will be quite similar and maybe even lower than the Model S. Weight distribution is a similar story, where electric cars with their batteries spread evenly deliver very close to 50-50 weight distribution from front to back. The Tesla Model 3 delivers a weight distribution of 47-53, biased toward the rear of the car. This is very similar to performance cars like the BMW 3 Series. So while EVs do weigh more than their petrol counterparts, they have great flexibility in design, don't need big heavy engines, and can deliver some incredible center of gravity figures. We know there is a lot of information in this video, but there was just as much we had to cut to try to fit this into a YouTube video. We spent a lot of time making these, and if you're interested in supporting us, check us out on Patreon, and we'd be honored to have you as a patron. Have ideas for future videos, or want us to get more in-depth in some of the topics we've covered here? Just write to us, leave us a comment, and let us know. If you're new, we're Tuba Da Vinci, and we're going to cover the future of energy and transportation. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that like button, and the notification bell so you won't miss anything we have planned for the future. If you love aviation, check out our second channel, 2-Bit Aviation. We're 2-Bit Da Vinci. Thank you for watching.